All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm gonna give it just a minute here while everyone gets logged on. Coming in quick. Let us know where you are calling in from. And then today's uh, fun question, controversial, might have lots of different opinions here. What is your favorite Thanksgiving side, side dish? I'll throw it in the chat this way. While we're waiting, Bill, let us know what your favorite side is. Yes, I was just I was just typing mine in, but uh, I think cornbread stuffing is my favorite. I like all kinds of stuffing, but um, last few years, the cornbread has been the, the better one for me. What about you, Mindy? Um, I'd say pineapple surprise. It's like a pineapple bread pudding that my mom's made every year. So I love to have it. <laughs> I think Greg's is stoked up. I mean, stoked up stuffing is delicious. Every day of the year. <laughs> yes. I was telling Bill and Mindy before we logged on, mine's a broccoli and cheese casserole that I've had since I was a child. It's basically butter, Ritz crackers, Velveeta, and frozen broccoli. And it's delicious. It's like, not to like. You would love as a toddler, right? A toddler should like that. Yeah. Ooh, carrots you play. Fancy. Yeah, yeah. seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Mac and that's, that's too uh oh, that's too fancy for my family, I think. <laughs> give it just a few more seconds. I used to cook and it's like we have the same thing, like this like way too many things, but the same like hundred things every single year. And you can't add anything and you can't subtract anything. And it's. No new things. You don't try new things. I try to try new things. And then my dad gets upset with the classic. Very, Arizona, very rarely. New and old things. Yeah. I mean, it'll just go to waste because yeah. you know, everybody likes to come and, and take things home. And they never bring containers, by the way. But they they like to take things home. But if you make something new that's out of the 100 things, then they won't take it. So. Yeah. It should be something that I like if I do that because I'll end up eating it all. <laughs> yeah, that is a tradition. We should start like bring Tupperware just in case if you're going to someone's house for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we we'll, we can go ahead. Let's and get do it. All right, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I'm Katrina McAfee. I'm the director of growth marketing here at Association Analytics. Um, today you're joining us for a deep dive with CMAA getting the most from all your system data. So today you can see we have Bill Conforti, he's our SVP of Strategy Solutions. And then we have Mindy Benedict, a special guest. She's the system admin for construction. Oh, I got a typo in there. <laughs> construction Management Association of America. Um, I will turn it over to Mindy to introduce herself and then we'll get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Mindy Benedict, as she mentioned, I'm the system administrator at CMAA, and I've been with CMAA for eight and a half years now, uh, serving as the Salesforce administrator is my primary role, and then managing all the systems that we have integrated and connected to that, uh, which we'll get into a bit today. Uh, so I think it's the briefest description or teaser I'll give for now. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks, Mindy. So, uh, yeah, I think you guys know me, so I'm going to uh, skip that part. Uh, so get into the agenda. We'll do intro and polls, right, as usual. Um, yeah, so we've done some of these before. We've talked about different uh, AMS platforms. We've done a session on NetForum. We've done one on IMIS. Um, in Mindy's case, they are using Fontiva, but we didn't really mention that specifically because I think there's, there's a lot um, that we're going to talk about in today's session that's going to be uh, for everyone, right? And it's not all all tech stuff either. So um, this is going to be um, this is going to be a fun one. We'll break it up as usual. Talk about how it was, how it is now. We'll spend a little bit of time uh, looking ahead. Mindy has some pro tips for us uh, at the end, and of course there's Q and A, which yeah, there'll be some time at the end. But you know uh, the way we like to do it is jump in with your questions at any time, uh, and let's keep the chat uh, lively if we can. 
All right, so a uh, little bit about association analytics. Uh, you know, the name kind of says what we are. We work only with associations. All we really do is analytics. We've been doing that, uh, you know, exclusively for uh, about 10 years, uh, give or take. Company uh, in general is a little over 20 years old. Um, we, have, we are the developers of the analytics platform called Acumen AI, which uh, we won't really talk about today, but we'll... Uh, uh, you know, we'll uh, refer to it, you know, in, in a few different uh, places. So um, that's enough about A2. I'm going to get Mindy to tell us about key facts and key information about CMAA. Thank you. CMAA, it stands for the Construction Management Association of America. And we currently have over 20,000 members. Uh, we do have a hybrid membership model. So 20,000 members consist of organizations and individuals in the construction management profession. And our main goal in that space is promoting, educating, and developing those professionals, providing certifications, events, opportunities for professional development, and networking. Uh, as of now, we've certified over 5,000 professionals called the Certified Construction Manager Program in the last six years. And our latest big stat is that we've awarded over 250,000 continuing education credits. Um, so our industry is big on professional development and making sure construction managers are staying up to date on best practices in the industry. We have a staff uh, at CMAA of about 23 uh, at latest. Uh, this week, we just onboarded our last person to fill out our full staff and added a government advocacy position. So we're taking on uh, that role now for the construction management industry. Um, and the rest of our staff is spread out amongst membership, professional development, and certification. All right. Um, awesome. Thanks. That was... Uh... Really good, uh, really good description. Um, so this this image um, is is kind of uh, funny. Um, so I, I've been uh, playing around with uh, um, AI generated images in uh, in most of the uh, webinars, the last uh, last three or four of them. And so I can't remember the exact prompt, but uh, so the first thing I did is went to CMA site and see if there's any you know good images. And like, well, there, there there's a few, but it's mostly just people. Like they could be anyone. So I wanted to go in and uh and find one that looked like construction managers and this is what uh gpt4 uh came up with and i think i said um uh construction managers at work with a large scale capital construction site in the background something like that so um i think they did a a pretty good job with this one there's a few more of these um throughout and uh, let us know what you think of this uh, okay so we're going to go to polls and whoops, sorry. And so for the polls, uh, we're going to use Slido. Um, so you can uh, point your phones to the QR code and uh, and join, or you can also uh, join on the website. So we'll give you a few few seconds to uh, to do that. Once you once you get on, um, especially if you're doing it on your phone, there is a polls section um, and there is a uh, Q and A section. Right. So we're going to use the side that says polls. And uh, once I go to the next slide. Uh, the first poll is going to come up. So as I said, this is not really a specific uh, AMS talk per se, but uh, a lot of the background to what we'll be talking about is about, uh, you know, what's really the role uh, should your AMS have uh, in your tech stack? And we're going to talk about all the other uh, elements of a of good association uh, uh, tech stack as well. So um, this one is kind of just for fun, really. But uh, first question is, tell us if you agree uh, with this one or not. There we go. Our association is happy with our current AMS. No fives, no happy faces. Uh, Hard images up. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so one of the one of the nice things about the active polls is it tells us how many people have voted, and so we can see that a lot of people didn't participate. So, um, is it 
rather not say. And we didn't ask what AMS you're using. So if you want, if you're worried about offending anyone, we don't have to worry about that. Um, so look, I mean, this, uh, aside from the fact that the participation was low, this is about what we see, right? Um, the most of the time, most associations that we talk to are either in the process of looking for, or they uh, are actively switching, or they just switch. You know, hardly ever um, have uh, uh, a client or prospect that's been using the AMS for years and they're super happy with it uh, and all of that. So, um, I would say that it's probably not always the fault of the AMS, right? I mean, there's you know political reasons. Sometimes you just get burnt out. Or maybe more likely you're using it for things that it's not meant to be uh, very good at. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, some of that today. So uh, one more question uh, before we move on. All right, we've asked this one in in different languages a few different times. But uh, what is your biggest challenge to getting useful data and insights? All right, integrations, data quality. Uh, you don't have the knowledge. You need more training. That sort of thing. Um, or something else, time and resources, or other. And if you say other, if you can uh, let us know in the chat, that would be appreciated. Interesting, okay. Uh, knowledge and training. Uh, so what do you think, Mindy? Anything surprising to you here? I'm interested in the other, uh, as always, but I would have said knowledge and training as well. Um, awareness and understanding of the data that we have. You can have a lot of data and not really know where to begin or what to do with it. And so it's that kind of knowledge uh, that I think of when I see knowledge and training. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, um... That's a little surprising to me, right? I mean, I would have expected that to come in third, right? Behind integration um, and behind data quality. Um, uh, we have some, um, we have some uh, uh, very uh, conscientious, uh, you know, uh, data hygiene, you know, people on, on this call today were taking good, uh, good care of our data. So if you said other, um, looks like there's just a couple of you. If you can tell us in the chat what is uh, your biggest challenge, that'd be great. Uh, but, you know, if knowledge and training, or at least the knowledge part, is uh, uh, is a problem for you, we can uh, cover some of that uh, today. So uh, Mindy has uh, done a lot of this, and uh, she'll be able to uh, give you some good tips along the way. So, okay. So with that, uh, we're going to go to how it was. And you know, we have this really old... Uh, computer, which we've used before, uh, but we're not going to go quite that far back. In this case, we're going to go to 2016 and our first AI-generated uh, association professional, right? So this is our our, our Mindy uh, avatar, right? So for effect, we made it look like she's frustrated, right, at the lack of data and lack of insights um, that she's able to get. Um, and, but I, I don't know, that, was that really the case for you, you know, going back that far? I think maybe not. Yeah, I'll talk a bit about the image is one of my favorites uh, because there were definitely times where you feel like that. Uh, I think during the migration process, uh, going from an old AMS to a new one, which is where we were in 2016, uh, CMAA was using ACGI uh, or Association Anywhere another name for that product, which is purely a membership management system. Um, and they, we were looking to get away from that and move towards something that could do more than just manage new members and renewals coming in. Um, we had separate systems for everything and we wanted a system that could at least do one or two more things than beyond men membership and easily integrate with other systems. We knew that we weren't going to find one system that could do it all, but something that could do the most. Um, and Fontiva is built on Salesforce. Salesforce isn't always the first product that associations think of because it's very big, large in the sense of it's well-known, but well-known in a different industry. It's 
for sales is what it was originally started for and built for and can often be beyond the budget of an association um, and have too many sales features that we feel aren't necessary or related to what we're doing in associations, but the Fontiva application on top of it, specializing in what associations do, managing membership, event registration, um, having an ebook or electronic bookstore, all of those things are what attracted us to Fontiva back at that time. And so in 2016, we we're going through that migration where you're extracting all the data out of ACGI and formatting it into spreadsheets that Fontiva can import into their system so that you don't lose all of your historical data. And so a lot of times it felt like uh, the sentiment in this picture, for sure. Uh, so that, that's actually a question I was going to ask you is because uh, we get this question all the time and I bet some of the people uh, that are listening are in the process of, or at least considering switching to uh, uh, switching to a new AMS. Um, how many years of historical data from uh, from ACGI did you bring into Fontiva? If you're, I think we went back. So it was 2016. I think we went back three years, maybe three to five. Um, we definitely wanted to retain for membership. It was really important that we retained original join dates. We did have some people who have been members. I mean, the association's been around a long time. We had members with original join dates of you know, 1998 and we wanted to keep them in there and maintain their original join dates. Um, so that data, you know, we really had to go back further in some sense, uh, but we didn't need all of their history of every um, event registration that they might've had since 1998. So for event registrations, we were just going back about three or four years. Um, and we didn't bring over, I don't think any historical purchase data that was a separate system. Uh, so really, I'd say about three years for everything except for membership and for membership, we were mostly looking to retain that original join date. Yeah. Okay, so if I joined in 1998, you you wanted to reflect that, right, for for tenure purposes and things like that, but you didn't necessarily bring in every transaction since 1998. Right. Good. <laughs> okay, so three to five years. I think that's that's really smart, um, and that's the that's the answer that um, that we typically give to any um, yeah, any client or any any prospect in terms of uh, the amount of, histo of historical data. Um, so Philip is asking in in the Q and A. How many gigabytes is your Fontiva database? And do you add storage annually? Yes, we do have to continuously add storage. There was a, I think we're at 10 gigabytes right now. Uh, I was just going to pull that up to see, but we've had to continuously add. There was a big jump a year or two ago uh, where what Salesforce was providing out of the box without paying was increased and that saved us from having to do an increase for a year or two. Um, but we're looking at a, another increase and jumping to a different band um, instead of just adding one gigabyte, looking at beyond that. Uh, because as we integrate with more systems or bringing in more data and we are bringing in more contacts, um, so the contacts and transactions are really what take up the bulk of our data, uh, as well as some of the integrations we're pushing data back into Salesforce. Um, and that takes up a lot of space uh, to push back things like email tracking. So any emails that go out of our e-marketing system, tracking the open and click rates, we have that pushing back to Salesforce and that takes up a significant uh, amount of space. And we are actually at 20 gigabytes now we we doubled this year at our renewal um, okay yeah and is the uh is the additional storage i mean uh this is for my reference people that uh, are listening may know this already but is it is the additional cost is it like between something that's trivial and something that really has to be deliberately planned and budgeted for like uh how would you describe it Definitely planned and budgeted for, uh, but that is really the case for me with everything with Fontiva. We're on an annual budget. So in September, I'm collecting budget numbers for January to December of the next year. 
asking Pontivo what their percentage increase is going to be because that goes across the board where you're paying for licenses, storage. Um, so it's always something that we have to plan and budget for. And if I know we're integrating another system, I know we're going to need more data and potentially more customer logins. Um, so we do try, we have to plan ahead for those so that our bottom line for our renewal is accounted for. Okay, uh, good. All right, so we so we talked about storage and kind of the overall increase in the uh, in the system, but uh, any other way that that comes to mind for just I'm curious, like how your Fontiva system, you know, never mind the other systems that we'll talk about, but how has your Fontiva specifically, how has that evolved over time? Like how have you uh, developed that or customized it or those kinds of things? Sure. So a big part of customization or big leap that we made was when, again, forced our hand by Salesforce, they moved from classic to lightning, um, which yeah. changed things for staff, users, and admins, but also for our customers and members who are interacting with our store, our event registration, and signing up for membership. And overall, it was a positive experience. It's a better UI, um, more user-friendly and easier on the eyes. It was a much more modern look and feel. Uh, but beyond that, as a system administrator, moving from classic to lightning meant that I could customize a lot more on my own without having to go through Fontiva's managed services or enlisting developers to create visual force pages for us. Um, I've been able to create new pages to explain our foundation. Uh, what does our the CMA foundation do? Why should you donate? How can you donate? Uh, and just being able to create more pages and customize our member portal has been a lot easier in lightning and accessible. Okay. Uh, awesome. Now, was there any specific uh, training that, that you took in order to learn to do that or did, was it self-taught? Um, mostly self-taught. Any of the the free trainings offered through Fontiva or Salesforce, I always take advantage of and playing around in our sandbox, um, yeah. always. Okay, um, good. Right for the benefit of those that are thinking that this is uh, that would part would be uh, too difficult for you. Okay, so there's a question that came in from Carmel. I'm going to hold it for just a second because it's kind of a good segue to what we're going to talk about here. So, what about the rest of your technology stack? So this is going to be over the course of, of several years. But tell us about what other tools. Um, did you uh, did you implement over time? Yeah, so to start from the beginning, I mentioned that we were using ACGI before Fontiva and we had separate systems for literally everything else, for e-marketing, for certification, event registration. Um, we went live with Fontiva in 2016 and spent two years stabilizing, just getting ourselves used to the system, making sure the data, the historical data we had imported was correct. All of our customizations were working. Uh, and then in 2018, we started a process of really integrating one system a year. Um, so we started with our website and integrated using single sign-on and some data flow from Fontiva into Drupal to populate our bookstore information. Mm -hmm. In the following year, we added e-marketing using higher logic. Then our e-bookstore, which is uh, a platform called Tizra. So if you're purchasing something like an electronic PDF of one of our publications, there's single sign-on into that store. And then in 2017, we moved to a new learning management system, which was a, a really big shift because we were we didn't really have a great learning management system before. And we also had our certification and recertification happening in two separate systems. So we replaced three with one, integrated top class uh, with Fontiva in 2020. Then we added our mobile app, um, which we use Clouder for. And then in 2021, we added government advocacy and we use Quorum for that. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot going on now. Um, I think those are probably all that we're integrating with right now. 
to my knowledge, um, for all of our existing programs. Okay. Yes, we put six, uh, six little green dots here. It sounds like you might even have uh, one or two more than that. So Carmen was asking about your accounting system. Do you, uh, what do you use and is that integrated with Fontiva? Our accounting system is intact and it's not integrated with Fontiva. We explored those options. Uh, we didn't think that the cost was worth it um, in our instance. One change we did make this year, um, I don't know that you would call it an integration because we had, it's something that's in place in pretty much all CRMs that do purchases, but you have a payment gateway. And we used to use authorize.net for our payment gateway. And this year we moved to Fontiva payments. They now have their own payment gateway. Uh, and so all of that transactional information is now native within Fontiva. And so we're doing a lot more financial reporting in Fontiva, but we're still exporting it and then importing into Intact. Okay, um, cool. Uh, so hopefully that, uh, that answers your question, uh, Carmen. So, so you have this like, I don't know, best of breed uh, type ecosystem. It's like all of like the top or very close to the top, uh, at least in the, in the association space, you know, products in each one of those um, areas. So uh, I'm curious, you know, and I'll ask you, and I wanna ask the, uh, the audience as well, if any of you are using Fontiva and I don't know, a lot of you are, you know, based on the questions uh, that are coming in. Um, did you consider tools that were from the broader Salesforce App Exchange, right? Because a lot of times when we choose a, a platform-based solution, it's because of the ready-made sort of tight integrations with this ecosystem of tools. So uh, ultimately, you decided not to clearly, but uh, is that something that you uh, considered? I considered it. Audience too. Yeah, it definitely was considered. Uh, I mean, during discovery for identifying new systems, new technologies, there's a lot of things that are considered at the very beginning before you whittle it down to the three or four that you're going to go through demos with. Um, for us, coming from an association and an association full of CAEs, Certified Association Executives, we are always looking to ASAE for guidance and exploring those communities to see what our peers are using and then also using the Fontiva communities because Salesforce is well-known and widely used, uh, but just because a system plays well with Salesforce doesn't mean that it always plays as well uh, with Fontiva. And we didn't want to waste our time on anything that was going to require a lot more development and customization because of the Fontiva element. And so if we went with a Fontiva partner, we knew we were most likely setting ourselves up for success given the, the partnership between the two. Cool. Um, so would you say, is it is it fair to say that your approach was to push as much of the data from these external systems back into Salesforce as possible? Always. I mean, that's yeah. always my party line is, well, Salesforce is our, Fontiva is our single source of truth. And anytime someone wants to add or integrate with something, they come to me to consult and advise on the integration process. And they know that I'm always going to require that Salesforce is where it starts and where it comes back to. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So this is... Uh... Uh, this is an approach that we see a lot and, you know, it's got some pros and cons and we've talked about these before, you know, it's a system that, that your staff come become very familiar with over time. And when it comes to access to specific data, it's usually, um, it's usually pretty fast, especially if you have an admin like Mindy that knows their way around everything very well and uh, can easily find that stuff. Now, um, yeah, this is cons and, you know, this is not, um, these are not necessarily all bad, uh, but you know, as compared to what we're going to talk about, a, a data warehouse centric system, you know, it's uh, it's only transactional data, and and in the warehouse, it's uh, a lot of it is also transactional, but there are other types as well. Um, integrations can be a challenge, so all of these blue arrows here are uh, are things that you have to go out and hire somebody to do, or you have to build and manage them yourself, and it's kind of uh, can be uh, could be expensive, and it can also uh, make it um, harder to uh, to scale, all right? Although, as I'm saying how hard it is to scale, we're looking at an example of, uh, you know, how, I don't want to say it was easy, right? But, um, you know, the, the Mindy story about the, the evolution of the product is, um, 
is is pretty uh, pretty amazing, and it's I would say it's the exception, you know, uh, across the uh, the associations that uh, um, that we talk to all the time. And last one is is limited analytics. So of course that's one of the main reasons why you've considered using uh, something like Acumen uh, in addition to Salesforce, even though. Uh, even though Salesforce and Fontiva have already have some really good reports built in and that you can uh, do some customizations with. Uh, so uh, you built out this amazing uh, technology stack. And so naturally you must have pushed really hard to get Acumen uh, added to that stack. So I wanted to give you a chance to tell us that story. Yes. So I work in the operations team at CMAA. My boss is the VP of operations. Uh, she's always empowered me to go forward with what I think is best. Uh, she defers to me uh, when it comes to anything related to our systems and technology. And this was one that she surprised me with. Um, she came to me and said, I've heard about amazing data analytics platform and ASE has done all of these great things and all of these associations are now using this for this data. Not only do I think it would be great, but I already signed us up. So here's your <laughs> next new project for this year. And um, she knew I'd be interested because I'm interested in all the other technology we've got going on. I'm always eager to learn a new system and I'm all about our data you know, making sure that the data we have in Salesforce is clean, making sure all those integrations are pushing good, clean data back to Salesforce, uh, relevant data. And we've accumulated a ton of it. And, you know, Laura, the VP of operations recognized that CMAA needed to move to the next level in terms of doing something with that data. And that my role as the system administrator had not tapped out, but we've integrated all these systems. We don't see that we're integrating anything new for the foreseeable future. So what's going to take system administration to the next level? And data analytics is what made the most sense. Uh, putting me in front of our leadership, so our board, our executive committee, to present insights that we've found through our data. And that's how she wanted me to be seen by leadership. And for myself, it meant, like I said, taking it to the next level and doing more than just being a system administrator. Awesome. Uh, thanks. We're going to, we're going to dive into that a little bit more in a sec. So before we get away from how it was, we have a question and the question goes like this, how do you handle in Fontiva pages developed in Seabase versus Lightning when it comes to events? and Fontiva hasn't moved them into Lightning yet? So pretty specific question. Uh, I'm happy to, I've talked with a few Fontiva customers in the past as far as being like a referral or uh, helping with anything specific. So I'm happy to talk more specifics about that outside of the webinar, but we've adjusted. Uh, we've either created custom pages or uh, we partner with a company called Fianta and they provide great development uh, services and assistance. Uh, and so we've actually started using them as opposed to going through Fontiva to get those customizations done. It's usually a workaround. Sometimes it's more expensive than you're willing to pay, but there's usually a way to work around it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. So let's get into um, how it is, right? So this is uh, this is new AI generated uh, um, Mindy avatar in the present day, right? So fast forwarding it a little bit. And right, so we were just talking about how you're kind of moving uh, right a more robust role, right? Um, which is still called system administrator. So we need to take that up. Um, offline with uh, you know with your uh, your boss at some point, but so tell us about like your um, you know more about your current role and kind of more specifically how it evolved right since uh, 2016, uh, Mindy till today. Yeah, so gosh, evolving back all the way from the beginning, I joined CMA on the membership team as a membership associate and then a membership manager which meant just managing the membership programs, accepting new applications, managing renewals and outreach. And I volunteered to be the system administrator when we were migrating to Fontiva because I had a personal interest in it, but no background. 
in being a system administrator. So I raised my hand to volunteer. Uh, we had new leadership that was very adamant about the importance um, of technology and my receiving training to be a Salesforce administrator. So I went through the formal Salesforce training for that back in 2016, but still was on the membership team because I don't think the association had really come around to seeing that this was a core system and product that, that wasn't just for membership, but that was for all departments at CMAA. Uh, it took a couple years, but then I was moved to the operations team, solidified my title as a system administrator, uh, and have been living in that operations team and title now for about five years. Uh, we definitely talk about title change. I'm open to anyone's suggestions uh, or for what you call someone in this more elevated analytics role. We haven't yeah. quite figured out what the best title is for it. Uh, but I really attribute a lot of my growth at the association to the leadership that we have, to the president and to the VP of operations who have always encouraged me to follow my, my passions and what I'm most interested in and really let me carve this role for myself. There wasn't a role like this at the association before. And they see the value in it. And so they continue to encourage it. And it really... It works out well for, for everyone. Cool. Uh, yeah, awesome story. So um, I just want to add one thing to that. And because we get this question a lot uh, from a from a leadership standpoint, if you are, um, you know, because it's it's always better if you have someone like you that's working sort of horizontally across uh, multiple departments and you know everyone's data, essentially. But reality is, going out and hiring someone like that can be expensive and hard to find and all of that. And so what they really want to know is how can I, how can I um, home grow that talent kind of similar to what you guys were able to do and say, so, well, how do I choose the right person? And the, the short answer is it's, it's less about their background and aptitude, although they have to have, you know, basic level of data literacy and all of that, but it's more about, you know, curiosity and, um, and who wants to do it essentially. So um, our experience is you'll most often find that person in marketing or in membership, probably membership and marketing in that order. Um, but both of those are kind of uh, where I would start looking if I'm, if I want to develop this, uh, this type of analyst role. And if you're lucky enough to get someone that's also, you know, technically able to get into uh, a systems admin role, then that's kind of, you know, killing another bird with the uh, uh, with the same stone so uh, yeah so great uh, uh, you know great story all around there uh, okay so with that uh, I want to get into uh, what we call the the data warehouse model and it's it's not that different you know from uh, from what Mindy was describing except that there is a separate repository for analytical data and and it's still Fontiva still the main source for that uh, but that gives you a couple of advantages, right? So uh, one of them is um, data migrations, you know, can be um, a little bit uh, simpler if you have this external repository um, for holding some of that historical data. Um, another one is storage is, um, you know, storage is pretty cheap, um, especially if you, if you have this uh, external repository and probably you also need, um, you also need fewer licenses, right? Because many of if Fontiva is your source of truth, that means that even just the consumers of data really need that seat license for Fontiva. And I think they actually have some tiered licensing now, which makes it a little bit uh, better. But um, generally speaking, you know, um, to go with some kind of uh, analytics platform solution, uh, at least in our case, it's um, it's unlimited. And so you can, uh, you know, especially for the consumers, it's gonna be easier uh, for them, right? Uh, all right, so you have this warehouse of pros, you have better, faster decisions. This is for the analytical data. It's a little, it's a little bit more scalable because the integrations are kind of, um, you know, handled uh, externally. Um, you have advanced analytics. It's foundational for uh, training, um, you know, machine learning models or, uh, or AI. And in the long term, there's, uh, there's a good ROI on these and even in the short term. But on the other hand, it's another tool, right? So it's like another thing that people have to learn. And don't, even though 
it'd be great if everybody bought Ackman, but don't underestimate that part, right? The the uh, the uphill battle to get people to take on and learn another tool. Not everybody is as ambitious and uh, curious as as many is. And then of course there's the short term cost, right? So year to year budgeting, there's still uh, one more thing that you uh, that you have to add, right? And so now um, fast forwarding to um, to closer to to current time, right? Um, Acumen is now um, Acumen AI, and I want to get back to that for uh, for just a second. So, just a quick detour uh, for Acumen. Um, so, tell us about your experience with onboarding and implementation, right? Because we get a lot of questions like, "Okay, this sounds great, but it's a big lift and it's a resource drain on us." And um, give us a sense for how that all worked. Yeah, onboarding. Um went really well for me. I like that there's an organized approach, uh, the different phases of discovery and implementation configuration. That's how my mind works and how I like to do projects. So that works for me. Um, and I found that the discovery phase, it's a lot of data, but that's what I like. And that's what I understand the most. And I was quickly able to fill out uh, what are some very helpful worksheets um, during that discovery phase where you're mapping everything, really you're explaining um, in your own terms how the data connects to the terminology used in Acumen um, because we don't all always use the same language across all of our systems. But I found the worksheets really easy to use and the project managers were great to work with and setting up regular meetings to go over those things, giving you a little bit of homework, hopping on a call to go over it together and doing workshops together uh, works really well for me. Um, but talk about um, like how you still uh, use Fontiva, right? I mean, this is not a replacement. Um, for Fontiva. So what are some of the examples of things that you still um, rely on, uh, on on Fontiva for, or even other, other source systems as well? Yeah, I'd say it comes down to lists. Um, so if you want a membership list, um, you're going to go to Fontiva for that financial reconciliations, uh, financial reporting, uh, all of those journal entries are still going to come out of Fontiva mailing list, at least right now, uh, because we have an integration between Fontiva and Higher Logic, all of our marketing and mailing lists are based on a Fontiva report. Um, and any event registration list, we're about to go to a conference, we need to download everyone that's registered and all of their contact information. So all of those lists, those lists you see with tons of rows uh, full of mostly contact information. Uh, is really what we're we're still always going to use Font Fontiva for that. Uh, there are tables and reports in Acumen, and I like to think that I'm the only one that gets down to that level of Acumen. That's not the level of Acumen that I mean for for my staff to get get down into. If they need something that's that detailed, uh, that's where I recommend that they go back to Fontiva. Awesome. Yeah, great answer. So. Uh... That's that's a big part, and this is a, a talk for another day. But that's a big part of of the new movement towards not just Acumen, but Acumen AI is, you know, like it or not, that's that's more or less true. What you say is that's a the the rank and file employees don't necessarily get that deep, and the exploration, even if it's intuitive, um, and uh, and easy, it's you know we don't all have time to do that, and so uh, more automation, more prescriptive, right? So we're gonna. Um, show uh, the things that you should be interested in, right? Surface that, you know, uh, put that right in front of you with some kind of a prompt and then also uh, prescribe or at least suggest, you know, some solutions that um, that could be uh, that could be available to you. So, uh, yeah. So what what about marketing? I think we said higher logic. But we didn't say specifically what uh, uh, which tool you use. Um, the e-marketing tool of higher logic. It used to be called Real Magnet. Um... But we're not using higher logic communities, but we are using all of their e-marketing. So anything that's uh, building contact lists and sending email messages. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Ooh. <laughs> uh, do you have any member engagement scoring data in Acumen? That's 
that's coming up, but we can let's uh, let's go ahead and answer it now. Just the the quick version. We do. <laughs> the answer is we do, um, and it comes from all of those integrated systems and all those systems are talking back to Salesforce, and so it's been a process of getting uh, that data not piece by piece, but program by pr program, we needed to get that into Acumen first so we could roll it up into engagement. But we do have those in there now. Okay. Um, so one of the things that that we talk about with all of our systems, right, and, and it's it's kind of core to the, the mission of Acumen and, and why people would uh, potentially use it, but even if you don't have it, right, you still want to be able to take action you know, based on the data in your key systems, right? So even if you were just uh, using uh, data that you found in Fontiva, but give us uh, give us an example of of a, a decision, something major that you are able to to make because of insights that you found uh, in your data. Yeah, so uh, something big that we've been working on this year is a task force that we have for international expansion. Um, so the task force is part uh, made up of some of our board members, some of our staff members to see if it makes sense for CMAA to maybe start an international chapter or start publishing some of our publications in other languages. Um, do we need to hold events in other locations to really serve our, our membership? And international expansion as an idea or concept gets brought up all the time, I'd say for the last few years by our members, there's always one person that's at least going to mention it. Um, but this year, the task force really took on digging into the data to see, okay, does it make sense to do this? Do we have enough of a presence in other locations? Are they centrally located in another particular area? Is everyone all spread out? Um, I won't say what the, the final answer is on that because they just talked about it last month um, when the final data was presented, uh, but we utilized our geographic data, looking at our sales, membership, event registrations, all of those things um, to see if it's a decision that makes sense for us and whether or not it's something that makes sense for us now, or do we need to wait in the future and see if, if it expands? Awesome. And uh, one other quick example, we talked about uh, chapters a bit. So I know that yeah. that's a, a common pain point for uh, for many people. So uh, tell us about that. Like, what is uh, what does that look like for you now? Yeah, so we have 30 regional chapters in the U.S. Um, and we have a staff person dedicated to assisting chapters. So each chapter has its own leadership and they all uh, work with the director of chapters that's on staff at CMAA to find out how they should be running events, managing their own membership, uh, best practices and associations and all of those things. And in order to provide resources to the people local to their chapter, they need to know who's in their chapter. And we've always sent out those 30 chapter rosters manually. Uh, so chapter director at CMAA runs a report in Fontiva, attaches it to an email and sends it to the current president. Um, We've ha we have them sign NDAs because it's you know, with proprietary information. We don't just want to be giving out the membership list. And it's always been this arduous manual process and they've always asked for something more. Our chapters have always wanted a real time list uh, because it's one thing to be able to ask for it from staff, but they only get it once a month and right. they really wanted to be able to do it on a regular basis so that more people could register for events um, and take advantage of the resources as opposed to waiting until next month to be added. So right. I guess that, <laughs> That's the current process or how it was. All right. Yeah. So this is uh um and then how and what about now? All right. So let's uh let's let's sort of tie that up before we move on. Yeah, so enter Acumen. Um and we knew Acumen was very powerful and there had to be a better way to do what we were doing right now. Um, and so we utilized my Acumen to create chapter reports and the fascinating thing about that was that we still thought we were going to need 30 reports. We thought we were going to need 30 Acumen reports and we would give those 30 presidents access to Acumen and just those reports. Uh, we were actually able to use 
new features in Acumen AI to create segmentations so that Acumen AI knows that I'm the president of the New York, New Jersey chapter. And so I'm going to access the same report as the Virginia chapter president, but because it recognizes who I am, it's showing me my data. So we only needed one report, 30 users, got unique reports. Um, and then we were able to do more than just an Excel sheet. Um, we were able to add filters so they can go into that report and quickly and easily see who is certified, uh, quickly segment by member type, um, and also add some demographic information so they could see the breakdown of their chapter um, by all the demographics that we've collected at National. So extending all the data that we have to the chapter so they can use it. Cool. Awesome. Uh, all right, cool. Last, uh, this is future uh, uh, Mindy Avatar. So I, I asked for, um, you know, a futuristic looking office with, uh, this is supposed to be 10 years, uh, uh, 10 years ahead. So this is what um, GPT-4 generates when you ask for futuristic office and to take our um, Mindy Avatar and, and age it uh, 10 years. So anyway, uh, so I want to talk in, uh, you know, talking about moving forward, I want to talk about adoption, right? So this is, uh, it's really common. It's a, it's a fear and obstacle that uh, bad associations bring up when they're hoping to pursue, you know, buying acumen or really data governance or any kind of uh, uh, data initiative, right? So what's been your experience so far and what advice do you have? For those that are worried about or or struggling with adoption, and I do realize this could be a whole hour's webinar by itself, but uh, give us the uh, the quick version. Yes, I'd say the most important thing is to not let anyone forget about it, um, because you do have a lot of systems. Everyone has a lot going on, and unless someone is there in the beginning, reminding everyone and bringing up Acumen at every possible opportunity. Uh, it's easy for people to say, well, I'll just go and get this full list from Fontiva, or I'll make an assumption based on my own knowledge about what I think is best for us to do next year uh, in terms of future planning. Uh, and so presenting those use cases um, has been a really valuable tool. Uh, taking things that people were doing before and transforming them into acumen without them having to ask and then sort of saying, you're no longer doing it this way. Here's a new report that's giving you the same information, but it's better, um, has been the best way for me to get people logging in every day um, mm -hmm. and using Acumen for their insights and trend reporting and forecasting. So you really have to keep it top of mind until it becomes an everyday reflex for them. Um, and with international expansion, when they knew they needed that data, Acumen was what they thought of first, not Fontiva to get that. And that was a really a testament to adoption there that it was the first thing that they thought of when they needed data for that. Okay. Hey, but, but of course you practice, right? Because all of the same techniques apply to all the other systems you did adopted over, yeah. over the six years prior, right? So this is not uh, not a data thing or not, even, not an Acumen thing specifically. It's really a a change thing, right? If you want this yes. change to stick, um, you have to kind of put in the work to do that. So um, great suggestions uh, there. So in terms of um, other things that are new, um, looking ahead, uh, what uh, what additional uh, data uh, are you looking to uh, to add to the mix? Well, we were just in a staff meeting this week and had two or three staff members mention some evaluations and surveys that they had just sent out post event surveys, uh, speaker surveys, and all these sort of evaluations and data that we don't import into Fontiva. Uh, some of it's anonymous and that's why we don't add it there because we link everything back to a contact in Fontiva. And so I put it out there to them, let's get that survey and evaluation data into Acumen and see what it tells us, see what it looks like because you've only ever looked at it in Excel as an Excel sheet of text. Um, so I'm anxious to get that in there and to do a little bit of a full circle with our chapters. We're sending all this data out to our chapters, but I know that they're collecting data as well. And I'm interested to get that data uh, and put it back to into our data warehouse and acumen. 
And then moving forward with engagement uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, we really want and need to use engagement for those ROI reports um, for our membership because we just moved to an unlimited membership model where people are joining as an organization and having people sign up and we want to show the, the value that they're getting and that the members are actually engaged in using these unlimited memberships that the company is paying for now. Great, awesome. All right, um, so this is maybe the best part. We're gonna go to uh, pro tips and I think these are all pretty good. So let's, I'm not sure why we're bringing them in one at a time, but um, let's do it. So uh, partners, what, uh, tell us about it. Partners, yeah, so technical partners, I mentioned we worked with Fianta uh, because inevitably you're going to need to customize something or an integration is going to be beyond your own realm of expertise. Uh, I prefer a partner that will explain to me what they're doing versus doing the work, handing it over, and then expecting me to maintain something I don't understand. Uh, so I highly recommend getting someone that will work with you, not just for you. So this one that I think you talked about becoming the expert, right? Taking ownership of, of systems and um, and data. So is that is that something that someone that's not not so technical can do? Yes, I mean, so it doesn't even have to be the nitty gritty of the data. Although understanding the architecture um, of your data really helps the objects and fields and how they're all connected to each other, uh, but understanding your organization and how understanding the programs that you're providing, the services you're providing, who uses them, what the, even understanding that uh, is really crucial to a lot of this uh, and why it makes it a little bit easier for me because I've been here for a while. So I've learned a little bit about all of the departments. All right. So we had, we've had uh, others come on and tell us that adoption has to be driven from the top down, but you're telling us now um, that it should be driven from the bottom up. So, um, yeah, I mean, for us, it, it's actually been a little bit harder to get all of leadership on board. They can be sometimes stuck in their ways with the systems that they've always used. They love their Excel spreadsheet and yes, it, do. and, um, so giving them a little bit more than, you know, showing them what you can do beyond that spreadsheet, um, and again, in some cases, just making the switch and forcing it, um, which doesn't always work for everyone. But if you have the opportunity and you're able to, it can be a good way to get leadership into it. All right. All right. And so this embedding uh, data informed decisions, that's that's kind of like one of the ways that you do this bottom up adoption now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going into that annual business planning, uh, leading those meetings with the data and reminding everyone before we even sit down at the table uh, that we have all the data we need in order to set our KPIs and determine what, what we're going to do next year based on the trends. All right. Uh, awesome. I added one um, again for hire someone like Mindy, right? This is for uh, managers and uh, executive team members out there. Uh, there's really no one other key to success for data initiatives generally is to having, you know, one one person or a small group that's uh, horizontal across your data sources that knows how to get things done. Uh, uh, we have a suggestion in the chat for systems analyst as a title. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, that's on the right track. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to leave you with a couple of resources. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Acumen AI, um, you can schedule a demo. Uh, be be glad to hear from you. And if you just want to learn more in generally about analytics, so we have a ton of resources. There's on-demand webinars, there's resource papers, case studies, blogs, et cetera, et cetera. So I uh, encourage you to uh, check both of those things out. Uh, looks like we have one more question remaining. Ah, Carmen has to jump to another meeting. It's not a question. Uh, if anyone has one, now's, now's the time. we got about one minute left. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for the participation. Thank you, Mindy, for all of your great uh, insights. Um, I personally learned a lot. I'm sure that the uh, audience did as well. And look forward to seeing everyone on a future webinar. Thanks again.